Hi, I'm Victor DiGrotola from the Department of Biostatistics, and I have the pleasure today of having a conversation with Professor Jim Ware about his 25 years of service as a statistical consultant to the New England uh, Journal of Medicine. And uh, to begin with, Jim, can you tell me something about the history of the role of statisticians at New England Journal? Well, I was thinking about that, uh, and you and I had talked a little bit about this conversation, and I was reflecting on that history. I came to Harvard in 1979. Fred Mosteller was the chairman, and Fred hired me. And Fred was a, an inspirational figure. People loved to work with him. He, was, he would work on all kinds of different problems. He, I always thought his work on the Federalist Papers was a marvel of uh, taking statistics into a new question. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so he really was able to mobilize people or, to work together. And he created a working group to study uh, statistical practices in the medical literature. And he was a very, and this was now around early 1980s. And uh, he was a very good friend of uh, Bud Relman, Arnold Relman, the editor of the New England Journal. And uh, John Baylor was here also, who's a physician, PhD in statistics, and a very thoughtful person. And so Fred and John Baylor, with support of Dr. Relman, uh, created this working group that worked for several years to, to get an understanding of the kind of work that, the statistical work that underlay the New England Journal publications, and then to communicate about them. And they wrote this book, this is the third edition now, and this version is edited by John Baylor and David Hoagland. As I recall, the first one was edited by, by John and Fred. And in this book, they describe what statistical practice are used in the New England Journal. They describe the study designs that are used and do a kind of an analytical, how do you design a crossover study, for example. And then they give advice to readers. If you want to read the New England Journal, what, how much statistics do you need to know? And so there were some interesting articles like that. Well, if you only know the chi-squared test and the mm -hmm. t-test, can you read anything? Well, it turns out you could read a lot at the, mm -hmm. in those days. Mm -hmm. So that was in the 1980s. And at that time, there was some presence of statisticians at the New England Journal, uh, but not very robust. I think John Baylor uh, participated for a time, and a, an assistant professor here named Larry Tebedo also did. And when I say participated, the New England Journal, throughout the 25 years I've been working with them, has a Thursday afternoon editorial meeting. And uh, it's presided over by the editor. And the, there are associate editors in different specialty areas like cardiovascular, cancer, neurology, and so on. And this, the associate editors will have articles that they think are candidates for publication. And they will present those. And then it's like a journal club. And then mm -hmm. everyone discusses. And then the editor decides whether or not to go forward with that article. So uh, I think John did that for a little while. But then uh, Fred, I think, spoke to Bud Relman and proposed that I start uh, come start attending the editorial meeting. And he did appoint me. And as of July 1, 1990, I started uh, participating regularly as a statistical consultant. Now, over time, uh, others joined. Walt Willett served, well, they used to call us the W's because it was Ware, Walker, and Willett. Alec Walker, uh, Walt Willett, and me. So they called us the W's, and that actually lingered for a time after we weren't the W's anymore. <laughs> and, uh, but over time, there have really been wonderful people that have served. At the present time, we have five uh, statistical consultants. David Hunter, our acting dean. David Harrington, former chair of... Uh, of uh, biostatistics and computational biology at the Dana-Farber. Sharon Lise Normand from uh, the Department of Healthcare Policy at the Med School, and Ralph D'Agostino so it, from BU. And so it's a wonderful group of colleagues, and the, and the conversations are very stimulating and really an, an enjoyable part of, mm -hmm. of uh, being involved with the journal. And so Every time we think we have enough statistical support, 
we come to a point where we feel like we need more. So just recently, mm -hmm. we added a fifth. We had, for, for a number of years, we had four statistical consultants, and, and uh, John, uh, Jeff Drazen said, uh, our current editor, said, well, I need more involvement of the statisticians. So he persuaded us to hire another person, Sharon Lease. Well, it certainly sounds like New England Journal has been at the forefront of engaging statisticians in the broad question of how to evaluate and make decisions about publication of manuscripts. And it sounds like you've been uh, a very big part of that um, process. And so can I ask you a little bit more um, about what your responsibilities were as statistical consultants? You've talked about the interactions with the editorial board. So the way, the way the process, very briefly, is that articles, the, the New England Journal gets about 15,000 submissions a year, and it publishes about 200. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what kind of a process it is. And, and uh, for those who've published in the New England Journal, you know it's very arduous to go through all, it's a very rigorous editorial process because not only is it uh, rigorous from a scientific point of view, but it's also rigorous from a stylistic point of view. I sort of think of it as a New Yorker of medicine. It's, mm -hmm. There's a, a voice that the journal has, mm -hmm. and that comes from a lot of careful editorial work. And there are really four layers of, of oversight of manuscripts. There's the editor, then there are the associate editors who are the disease area specialists, and they're senior people, distinguished people in the field who uh, make the kind of uh, up or down decision on a manuscript or really make a recommendation. Then they're the deputy editors and they are full-time or part-time employees but they're staff at the New England Journal and they're somewhat more junior but very very able and they closely manage the actual editing of the manuscript. And Then you have medical editors, uh, non-scientists who uh, are very involved and so so it, the manuscripts get a lot of scrutiny. But now how does it work? So the manuscript comes in, uh, maybe 50% or 60% of them are just sent back right away. Then a subset are sent out for review. Of the ones that review, maybe 20% come back with favorable reviews. Then the associate editors bring those to the journal meeting. And a typical meeting will have, say, 10 manuscripts. And uh, then at the, at the meeting, the, the manuscript is presented and uh, discussed, and then Jeff decides, based on the discussion, whether it's something to be published in the New England Journal. And at that point, the statisticians get involved. We don't actually review manuscripts until they've been judged of interest from a substantive point of view. And the criteria the journal has are if for choosing manuscripts to me, the two that stand out are first, is it right? So they really uh, obviously don't want to be publishing misleading information. But the other is, will it change medical practice as the short term? Is it going to make a difference? Is this manuscript going to have impact? So those are the criteria that are used to just choose the manuscript that are going, going to be considered further. And then we review them carefully and probably eight or nine out of ten of the ones that make it to that stage will make it past us, but with oftentimes a lot of uh, input about the manuscript. Uh, and maybe one out of ten or periodically one will just will say, even though you liked it, it's flawed, and then it'll be rejected. Well, in, at that um, stage of the process, uh, do you interact with the authors and let them know if you think that the other methods than the ones they've used might be more appropriate? Well, we don't. Or whether their claims are too strong. Right. We rarely <clears throat> interact directly with the edit mm -hmm. with the authors. That's the responsibility of the deputy editor. Mm -hmm. So on occasion, when it gets to be a difficult issue and the authors are resisting and are not persuaded, then mm -hmm. uh, the statisticians will be asked to join a conference call, for example, with the authors. But in my experience, I'd, that'll happen once or twice a year for each consultant, mm -hmm. that something rises to that level. Ordinarily, the we write very, so when we review the manuscript, we, as is customary with all the journals, prepare a detailed review with comments to the editor and comments to the authors, and then that's submitted to the 
to the authors and then they respond to that. So ordinarily the communication is electronic and on in writing, not by telephone or in person. Nice. Well, it's fascinating to uh, learn about the book, uh, Medical Uses of Statistics, yeah. and the role that New England Journal played in um, actually bringing together statisticians to review what the practice was and what the practice, um, uh, how it might be improved. Given your long experience with New England Journal, can, and can you talk a little bit about how the type and range of methods that have been used in biomed publishable biomedical research yeah. have evolved over time? The New England Journal, I think, is probably less, uh, you're less likely to find a sophisticated statistical method in the New England Journal than you mm -hmm. would be in some of the specialty journals. Mm -hmm. uh, in part because the New England Journal is wanting to communicate to a broad audience. Uh, it's a general medical journal and so it doesn't want to get too technical. But uh, the, so, you know, the, I was thinking about this question that sort of in the 80s was the period when, surprisingly, uh, regression and statistical methods of that type only made their way into general medical literature, say, in, mm -hmm. the, from, in the late 70s, early 80s. It was, uh, uh, you know, relatively late in some points of view. But you know, if, you, if you thought about descriptive methods and regression methods, including survival, purport, uh, logistic, linear, and so on, that probably covers 90% of what's published in the journal. Now, mm -hmm. what's changed in recent years, uh, the two kinds of studies that have gone, that have been presented new kinds of issues to us are genetics, of course. There's been mm -hmm. a lot of uh, genetics publications in the New England Journal and all the, the medical literature, and they have uh, a set of methods which are related to classical statistics, but distinctive. Mm -hmm. So, um, and sometimes pretty technical and raise methodologic issues. So. Uh, that's been one area where things have become more complex. And the other area where we see a new kind of challenge is in these so-called big data studies, the giant registry studies from Scandinavia, or the things that PCORI is doing, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, where they're collecting these massive data sets and trying to draw inferences about treatments. So the, I think those are the two types of new types of studies that have presented some new challenges. In fact, that's one reason we recruited Sharon Lease is because she has very strong expertise in, uh, in registry work. Well, you've noticed, uh, I, I've noticed that uh, you've stayed at New England Journal for many decades, and I'm just wondering what factors keep you most engaged in the position, and who have you found most inspiring to work with? Yes, well, it, as I indicated, well, uh, there's some practical reasons why it compl complements my role at the school. First place, most of the work you can do at your convenience, at, at a time that's convenient for you. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's not even required but recommended is to attend the Thursday meeting. So that's a two and a half hour a week commitment, but then the rest of the work can be done on your own time. Uh, so that's, that's a positive feature. And then uh, I think for me personally, it's a kind of work that if I have a strength as a statistician, I think it's working at the interface of medicine and statistics. Mm -hmm. Others of my colleagues I see as more uh, stronger methodologists and have made more of an impact as methodologists. But I think that I have been able to communicate to physician colleagues about statistical issues and to guide them on matters of study design and so on. And, and so that's a lot of the sort of thing that one does at the journal is you evaluate a manuscript and you decide whether the authors are doing the best they can to make the case for their, for their findings. And uh, that a lot of times that goes beyond sort of narrow statistical topics to a more communications issue. And uh, so I think what I'm saying is I think that the role I play at the New England Journal is a role that uh, mm -hmm. I feel like is a characteristic of the type of work I do. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously that's crucially important both for biostatistics and for medicine that that link be strengthened. That link be strengthened. 
What do you perceive as the biggest gaps in the use of quantitative methods reflecting the knowledge base and ideas both of the investigators and of statisticians yeah. who work on papers? And what are some gaps perhaps in the education that we do here at the school that's relevant um, for this type of research? I think I, I was thinking about this the other day that I think the medical literature is very conservative about statistics, mm -hmm. uh, about statistical practices, and they want things that are <coughs> simple and can be understood by readers who are not sophisticated quantitative scientists. And so there, there's a whole array of more sophisticated methods that are of great interest to statisticians and epidemiologists and quantitative scientists but you don't see very often in the medical literature, mm -hmm. and to some extent even less in the New England Journal than, say, mm -hmm. some specialty journals, as I mentioned. So, for example, causal inference. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a really important area, and I've been so taken by the work on how to think of, about clinical trials from a causal point of view when there's substantial non-adherence to the assigned regimens. And uh, there have been really interesting work about that, and uh, it's, that work kind of work has provided a lot of insight about the hormone controversy in the nurse's health study, but you don't see it. You know, that we never see, uh, I can't think of a manuscript that used causal inference in the New England Journal. So I don't think it's by, it's not lack of, it's not lack of openness to it. We don't get it. Mm -hmm. That type of manuscript doesn't come to the journal, it seems. So mm -hmm. I think, there's a, a level of more complex statistical methods, particularly that have emerged over the last decade or two, that have not made their way into the general medical literature. Mm -hmm. You don't see them in, a, in the New England Journal or Lancet or JAMA. Well, I think that's a really interesting point and an example of where more communication and education might potentially improve um, the uh, interpretability and reliability of some results. I wanted to follow up a little bit with an issue of missing data. Of course, I directed a statistical coordinating center for the AIDS Clinical Trials Group for um, um, many years. And uh, the problem of missing data arose in almost every study, yeah. and yet the canonical analysis is treat all the missing data as though it were missing completely at random, right. even though that's the strongest assumption, right. and even though there are many methods, including uh, those deriving from causal methods, the doubly robust estimation, mm -hmm. as well as um, uh, multiple imputation, uh, many methods for dealing with missing data. Uh, and a particularly large contribution has come from statisticians actually here at Harvard. So I wanted to get your thoughts of where you um, see uh, the um, applicability of uh, analyses for um, missing data, how widely these methods are being applied or should be applied from your perspective. Well, that is an interesting example. Well, um, back, it must be at least 10 years ago now, maybe 15, we received a manuscript on the Atkins diet, which, mm -hmm. as you recall, was quite a, the hot topic at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was a manuscript that was, I thought, quite instructive because it basically showed that over the course of a year, um, the Atkins diet did not have sustained effects on weight. And, uh, but it also didn't have uh, ad the kind of adverse effects people were worrying about. In any case, there was a huge amount of missing data. So the journal was, the editors were going to um, reject that manuscript because of the missing data. And I argued, and sometimes this is the way I've behaved as a statistician, I argued that it was a really important contribution to uh, the debate about diet and health and that despite the paper's flaws, we should take it. And then I was asked to write an editorial talking about the unfortunate, uh, unfortunately poor retention of study participants that made it impossible to do anything really sensible about the missing data. Mm -hmm. And uh, the paper got published, and it was the most frequently cited paper that year in the New England Journal. Now, um, when the NIH, or rather when the IOM, uh, or really National Academy of Sciences, 
convened the working group on missing data, <coughs> including Ralph D'Agostino was a member of that group, and a lot of other prominent people, Don Rubin and, and uh, others, and they wrote a very thoughtful uh, commentary on m missing data in biomedical research. And the, they first absolutely slammed the last observation carried forward or complete mm -hmm. data uh, analysis as assuming uh, missing completely at random and all those sorts mm -hmm. of methods. They were highly critical of them. And then they talked about the role of likelihood-based methods, not so much about causal inference, but they did then acknowledge that the uh, that when you have substantial missing data, at a certain point there's no methodologic way to overcome that with precision. And so then they recommended sensitivity analysis mm -hmm. as a kind of when you're really in that situation with a lot of missing data, you should do sensitivity analysis to assess how sensitive your results are. And then the, we, uh, the statisticians at the journal wrote a uh, short commentary saying that the journal endorsed their recommendations and would uh, follow their guidance in terms of uh, missing data in future manuscripts. And so we have, I think, strengthened our attention to missing data. But as you know, the missing data issue is so complicated. Mm -hmm. when, when does it become so salient that you have to really make it a major focus? Or when is it something that you can put in the background? And so there's no sort of simple universal solution to the missing data problem, but it's a major limitation of a lot of scientific research. Well, it sounds like that might be an area where developing some guidance would be useful. Um, I, my experience is that whenever you talk with investigators about doing adjustments for missing data, the response is, oh, well, then you have to make assumptions, not realizing that when you do no yeah. <laughs> adjustment, That's you're great. also making a strong assumption. Yeah. So it seems like this is an area that continues to be of importance. I wanted to um, just ask um, uh, about what you might see as your most important contribution to the New England Journal. I know you've spoken a lot about the contributions that you've made, both through um, communication and education of investigators and of editors, but is there anything uh, um, more specific that you'd like to uh, talk about with regard to um, your career there that you're particularly proud of? Well, the, uh, you're, because you're part of a large system, Mm -hmm. you, it's sometimes hard to isolate something and say, I mm -hmm. did this, or my mm -hmm. contribution was this. A paper uh, about which I'm proud and which I had an important role was a paper by Nicholas Christakis and colleagues on uh, social uh, networks. And uh, in the paper demonstrated that if your friends are overweight, you're more likely to be overweight. Mm -hmm. And that paper has gone on to generate a huge literature on Mm -hmm. uh, net, uh, so on social networks, and the journal was also not going to take that paper. And uh, there was again a time when I said, "This is a. I think this is a big deal." And mm -hmm. I, I think I turned the tide on that paper. I don't. You, the statisticians usually do not, are not pivotal in the decision up or down. Mm -hmm. uh, we may be pivotal about how the data are presented, and occasionally. Uh, in deciding not to take something that people like, but we usually don't champion the paper because that really falls to the, uh, the medical area specialty. But in this case, I said, I think this paper is really important and extremely interesting. And of course, it had wonderful graphics. And uh, so we did take it and we published it. And it was a uh, no, most frequently cited paper from that year's publications. Mm -hmm. Now, you know there's been criticism of that paper around basically the age-old problems about confounding and, and uh, indirect causation and all sorts of things. And, you know, those issues do have some merit. It's a complicated, uh, these social networks are really complicated multivariable models uh, that have certain assumptions built into them to, in terms of directionality and so on. And uh, so it wasn't perfect, but... Um, 
but I think it was a really interesting and important contribution. Mm -hmm. And Jeff said to me the other day, uh, we were talking, Jeff Drazen, the editor, uh, I hope you won't mind me saying this, he said to me, Jim, one of the things I appreciate about you is I, I appreciate the way you balance the importance and the rigor of the work, that we always in, we often have to make a judgment about, well, this paper is not perfect, it's got certain flaws, but does the message it conveys, is it right, and is it important enough that we're going to publish it despite its limitations? And so in the two papers I mentioned, those were instances where I argued for the papers despite their mm -hmm. pretty significant statistical issues, especially the one on the Atkins diet. Well, I might say they're particularly of interest because of those statistical issues, because in fact I know that paper has helped to um, uh, encourage uh, research in exactly the area that you're talking about, confounding for highly dependent data and uh, network um, models. That's a great point. And um, in fact, we're planning a workshop here this spring to discuss exactly those mm -hmm. issues, bringing wow. people around, from around the country. Wow. And I know that people uh, here at school, like Tyler Vanderveel mm -hmm. and some of his students and protégés, have gotten engaged in part from mm -hmm. that work. I always think of biostatistics a little bit like Scrabble. It's nice when someone has a word that lets other people build on it, yeah. even if they didn't use all the high-value letters for their yes. word. And I think that this, your, your, I didn't realize, I knew you were involved in, uh, had a role in the publication of that paper, but I didn't realize how central it was. And uh, so it's exciting to get this on tape. Um, you've obviously had an enormously varied career. As you've mentioned, you've been an educator, uh, a dean at the school, and um, also very involved in the Catalyst Program for Translational Research uh, and um, obviously a major role at New England Journal. How have you uh, seen the synergies among those different roles? How has your New England Journal experience impacted your teaching, what you teach and how you teach it, and vice versa? How has your role as an academic teacher of biostatistics impact your work at New England Journal? What's fortunate about what you do is you get to see both ends, mm -hmm. um, both the education and then the consequences of the education uh, in the way that it plays out in, in uh, manuscripts. Well, I, I'm never, I'm always dissatisfied with my teaching. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel there's some people that are, seem to be gifted teachers and can just so easily connect with students and, mm -hmm. and communicate to them. And I, I don't feel like I've, I've never felt that I met that criterion, but I've cared a lot about teaching and I've put a lot of effort into it. And I do teach at the New England Journal. We have groups of residents and fellows that rotate through the journal. Uh, take a, like a four-week rotation to learn about the work of the New England Journal, and they'll, they'll, so we'll have didactic material for them. So I will teach them, and I will teach them about uh, non-inferiority or about pragmatic trials or sort of what something that's not your sort of basic fare, but something a little more uh, sort of second level. Um, and uh, and at the school too, uh, I I don't I. Of course, I taught the clinical trials course mm -hmm. for uh, several years, and clinical trials is a big part of the content of the New England Journal. Jeff uh, Drazen, when he became the editor, said that he wanted to move the journal toward publishing more basic science and more clinical trials, and to, he thought there was too heavy an emphasis on epidemiology, mm -hmm. observational research, and so he's tried to steer the journal away from that, although there's still plenty of observational work published in the journal. But uh, with clinical trials, uh, that's been a synergy because I read a lot of clinical trials in my role at the journal, and then I can bring those examples. And actually, when you think about it now, the penny really drops that a lot of the cases I use in teaching clinical trials are from papers that mm -hmm. I thought were especially interesting that appeared in the journal. Well, I mean, I hate to disagree with you, but having taken your course in multivariate analysis in 1983, I certainly have to say that I would definitely place you in the category of very gifted teachers. Well, that's and undeserved, I, but much appreciated. <laughs> well, I have uh, made great use of the material that I learned in a very short period of time. I just marvel at what you've accomplished. And mm -hmm. 
who knew that you were going to be a rocket, you know? Well, <laughs> again, I'm not exactly sure that I could uh, support that characterization, <laughs> but I have to thank you for it. I wanted to, one uh, final question. As you know, I'm a um, great fan of the uh, writer and historian Tony Jutt, and he talks about the importance of public intellectuals in um, the uh, intellectual and political life of, of society. And I certainly see you as the statistical uh, version of a public in intellectual with your uh, both academic interests and credentials and your broad impact. So I'd like to ask you a, a broader question, which is what do you think are the most urgent questions in biomedical research today, and how can quantitative scientists help in addressing them? Uh, that is, of course, a very challenging question. Um, certainly, to start with the low-hanging fruit, one of the major problems is the slow progress in assessing, identifying and assessing the effects of new treatments. And uh, the clinical trial system is maybe broken, is too strong a term, but it's definitely uh, underperforming. Um, first place, um, the process of getting through the FDA is incredibly arduous and costly. And for complicated reasons, fewer and fewer Americans are willing to participate in cl clinical trials. So that has really slowed down the clinical trials machine and and now people are turning <coughs> in a more serious way to um, observational data. And there are two impeti, impeti for that, if you will. One is, well, if since we can't do a, and by the way, the drug companies oftentimes do the clinical trial that doesn't answer the clinical question. The physician want, will want to know, is your drug better than the drug I'm using now? But in order to get FDA approval, the company will do a placebo-controlled trial, assuming that it's ethical to do that. And so they don't answer the question the doctor really wants them to answer. And uh, so that's a problem, too. So that has motivated these efforts to synthesize data across many large and uh, related data sets to get insights from so-called big data approaches. We know, we all know, you and I especially know what the hazards of that approach are. But on the other hand, uh, I think under observational research is sometimes uh, unfairly devalued. It's, it has its limitations, but, uh, but uh, it does have a role to play. So that's one reason. Can we use observational data to study the questions that aren't being studied by the clinical trials enterprise. And the other is this considerable interest now in uh, patient-specific treatment guidelines, uh, so-called patient-centered outcomes research, where you try to figure out, get past the X is better than Y to X is better than Y for men older than 50 with elevated uh, uh, blood pressure, for example, <coughs> and that is a really major and exciting area of research, very challenging, but you, we're really in an era now, it's fascinating to me, coming uh, having come up in an era of much more modest computational capacity, to see what people can do now, and the power of, of writing the right software and then crunching these massive data sets mm -hmm. is is fascinating. It'll be interesting to see how it goes. And it's uh, created a new kind of scientist, the bioinformatical, bioinformatics scientist who knows some statistics but wouldn't call him or herself a statistician. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that's, that's an, I think those two areas are really important. How can we accelerate the process of evaluating therapies and how can we individualize our recommendations. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like there are a lot of synergies between those two goals I as think well. So. Well, I want to thank very much Professor Ware for chatting with me this afternoon and for the Department of Biostatistics for setting up this opportunity. Thank you, Victor. I enjoyed it. <laughs>